So long as they kept the organ, I mean, yeah, I mean, right that big, yeah. So, so somebody playing it? Always. Mm. I really was, my battery was there. He, he confirmed it. Okay.
morning. Good morning. Welcome to, to worship here at Cedarville United Methodist Church. I am thrilled to see all of you out here and uh, thrilled to have those of you who are worshiping online with us to join us for worship this morning. Uh, what are the chances, Jean and Chris uh, and Kathy, what are the chances if I ask everybody to move forward a couple of pews that they would do that? I, I just have to tell you that um, I'm I'm looking at our worship service live online, and it doesn't look like anybody's here. Now, I hope that those of you who are worshiping at home can hear all the laughter and hear people's responses. There are people in the sanctuary, they're just in the back half, which is not a surprise. That's where people like to sit. <laughs> Nobody ever wants my seat right up front here, I don't know. Anyway, um, I just wanted the folks at home to know that they're not worshiping alone. That we Oh, look, we have some takers. They're going to come up. Yay. Some brave souls. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, as we gather this morning for worship, it is always a joy to see your smiling faces and to know that there are others who are worshiping online. Um, and those who are worshiping online, I invite you, uh, as you feel ready, to come join us here in the sanctuary one of these Sundays as well. Um, just a note that if you are worshiping at home, uh, today is the first Sunday of the month and we do have Holy Communion, so if you are at home and haven't thought of that previously, I invite you to go to your kitchen and get a small piece of bread and get a small cup of juice and bring it into your worship space so that you'll be ready to uh, share in Holy Communion when that time in the service comes. Um, and for those who are here in the sanctuary, we have prepared, prepackaged grape juice and wafers, and you'll be receiving those, just so you don't think that we're going to give you pieces of bread open and cups. We're, we're not there yet, but we are going to have you uh, come up to receive them. Also, in three weeks from today, on August 22nd, is um, the Young People of Recreation will be leading us in worship. We'll have one worship service at 10 a.m. We'll all be gathered together in one service in the Family Life Center. Um, again, 10 o'clock that morning. And then we normally have our church picnic, but we're thinking that, you know, like a potluck, not so much right now. So we're thinking of different ideas, different possibilities of how we might still stay afterwards, fellowship with the young people of Recreation creation and have some fellowship with one another, uh, preferably outdoors if it's uh, nice enough weather. But anyway, just to put that on your calendar, August 22nd, one service, 10 o'clock. Um, and then more information will come out about that, what we're going to do. And if you're not receiving weekly emails from us, and uh, particularly you should be at least receiving one on a Wednesday and one on a Friday, um, because there's something that comes out every week on a Wednesday and a Friday. Uh, if you're not receiving those, um, and you have in the past, check your spam or your junk folder and see if anything's in there from the church. Um, and if not, check with Susan in the church office, give her your email address, and we'll work out and see what we can do to make sure you're getting the communications from the church. Also today, again, in your bulletins, each week now, we'll have our communication form. So if you would take a moment to complete that um, and let us know um, any information you would like us to know or prayer concerns and joys and let us know of your attendance here in worship. And um, we will invite you to bring those forward a little bit later and put those in the offering plate when you bring your gifts forward. I invite you to stand and to join me now in our opening prayer, which is printed in your bulletin. Let's pray together. Bread of heaven, come down. Come down and fill us with your spirit, for your spirit satisfies like no other. We hunger and thirst for you this morning and long to be nurtured in your love and forgiveness. So we come to this sacred time and place where our hungers are finally and fully satisfied as only your bread can do. We will wait and listen for your leading in this hour. Amen. Now I invite you in whatever form feels most comfortable to pass the peace of Christ with a nod, a wave, um, whatever is, is comfortable for you.
And I invite you to remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, I Come With Joy, number 617 in the hymnals or the words will be on the screen. Girls and boys, it's Mr. Sherrock here, and I'm very pleased to deliver the children's message this morning. I hope you're all doing well. You know, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Hmm, you know what, let's, let's play a really quick imagining game, if you, if you don't mind. Imagine that you are really hungry. Let's pretend you haven't eaten in like maybe two days. You haven't had anything to eat. Think about what that would be like. How would your tummy feel? I bet we would all have grumblings in our bellies if we hadn't eaten in two days. Now, I'm gonna show you some things and I'd like for you to think while I'm showing you them, I'd like for you to think of whether or not these things would help if you're really hungry, if you haven't eaten in two days. What about this first thing here? It's a really cute painted rock and there's a heart painted on it, a purple heart. You think that would help? Well, it might bring a smile to your face, momentarily make you feel happier, but I don't think it's gonna make your belly stop grumbling. Oh, hey, here's something. How about this box of tissues? Do you think this box of tissues would help? I don't think so, unless you need to blow your nose or maybe wipe some tears from your eyes. That box of tissues isn't gonna satisfy your hunger. Ooh, but maybe this might, this is kinda cool. It's a toy sailboat, or maybe a model ship. Actually, you know what, that's not gonna help either. It's not gonna make us not be hungry. I have something here that might help. It's a loaf of bread. You think that would help? I think that would satisfy our hunger. I think that we would stop having grumbling bellies after we ate some bread. You know, there's actually another type of hunger that we're gonna talk about today. It's hunger for life, hunger for meaning or purpose. It's a hunger for eternal happiness and joy, peace. And it's a type of hunger that cannot be satisfied by any of the material things that we saw before. The rock isn't really gonna do it. The tissues aren't gonna do it. The boat isn't gonna do it. Bread's not gonna do it. Not even chocolate donuts, believe it or not. 
Chocolate donuts won't satisfy that type of hunger. We need Jesus. Jesus, who is the bread of life, to satisfy that type of hunger. And you know the most beautiful thing about it is that God, who loves you very much, sent Jesus to save us. And we simply need to believe. We need to believe in Jesus. And we need to know that he is with us always. And then that hunger will be satisfied. I'd like you to join me in a prayer now. Thank you, God, for providing a way that both types of hunger can be satisfied. We have food, such as bread, to fill our stomachs and make our bodies work properly. Thank you, God, for also sending Jesus. He is the bread of life. Thank you that he is the one who can satisfy our hunger for a life of joy, love, peace, and purpose. Help us to trust him to follow him, and to know him as our friend. We ask this in the name of Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. All right, I hope everybody has a wonderful week. Thank you. And if there are any um, children that would like to go to kids' worship, I believe Mrs. Cherico is somewhere. Oh, okay. Well, I don't see anybody moving. <laughs> Let us now offer our prayers to God. O oh God of compassion, if you kept a record of our sins, who could stand? We come before you with our brokenness and our wounds for all to see. We bring our anger, our bitterness, our unwholesome talk, and our deceitfulness. We try to do good, but sometimes we fail. We choose to do evil and sometimes succeed. Keep your promise to forgive us when we confess to you completely. Without you, we have no hope. But when we confess our sins, you are faithful and you will forgive us. You provide freely with the bread of heaven all the mercy we need for life everlasting. The good news is the forgiveness we receive in the name of Christ Jesus. God of mercy and healing, you hear the cries of all who are in need. Receive now the prayers of your people for those we know have need of your loving and healing touch. And now let's take a moment to lift our prayers to God, either aloud or in silence. O oh God, hear our prayers as we offer them to you in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and as we pray the words that he gave to his disciples when he taught them to pray. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now Carol McDonald will, will share a journey, a journey of faith moment. Good morning. In our journey of faith here at Cedarville, we're invited to come, grow, and share. And this fall, we're offering you a chance to take a step along that discipleship path in an all-church study called The Walk by Adam Hamilton. Beginning the week of September 12th, we, this study, which will be similar to the story and believe that we've done in the past, however, this one's much shorter at only six weeks. The Walk is a simple guide to the Christian life written for ordinary people. 
It's written to help us follow Jesus, to experience more of God in our lives, and to grow to become the people Jesus wants us to be. In it, we'll consider five simple practices that Jesus' followers have always pursued as they sought to walk with him. Jesus himself modeled these practices for us. Pastor Sherry's Sunday message will introduce the lesson, and then you can participate in one of the study groups. There will be online, or um, there are six uh, in-person ones set up at this time, where you can watch a video, learn more, and share in group discussion. Children and youth will also be engaged in the same topics, but presented at their level. You'll receive an email with a link to an electronic sign-up sheet where you can order the accompanying study guide and sign up for one of the classes. And after sign-ups, we'll let you know when you can come to church and pick up your book, and there will be instructions in the book of how to submit payment for the book. But don't let costs deter you, as there are funds available if the uh, book is out of your range. If you do not use email or the internet, there will be a few paper sign-up sheets in the Narthex and lobby, although the electronic sign-up is strongly recommended. You can also call the church office, and Susan will record your sign-up. And if you have questions, you can email the walk, T-H-E-W-A-L-K, all one word, at cedarvilleumc.org with questions, and that will be answered. Or you can call the church office, and Susan will help you there, too. I look forward to walking with you as we deepen our faith and understanding of what Jesus offered when he walked along the shores of Galilee and said, come, follow me. Let's take the walk together. Thank you. And not trickle going down. Thank you, Carol. Freely we have received. Thus we freely give. Grace upon grace. Let us express our love and appreciation to God by extending the grace and mercy of God to a hungry world through our gifts. Those who are worship, worshiping with us in person today, I will invite you to come forward to present your tithes and offerings to God by placing them in the offering plate that will be on that table there. If you are an e-giver, you're now invited to take one of the green cards in the pew rack in front of you and place it in the offering plate symbolically representing your gifts to God in this act of worship. And everyone's invited to place the communication form in the plate as well. For those worshiping online, ways to present your tithes and offerings are shown on the screen and can be found on our website. I invite you to take a moment now to go online and prayerfully present your gifts to God in this moment as your act of worship. If you are an e-giver, Take this time simply to pause and reflect on your gifts given to God. Thank you for your gifts that allow us to continue in mission and ministry in the name of Jesus, our Lord.
Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We bow before you and thank you for the privilege to participate in your acts of kindness and love here on earth. May these gifts truly become instruments of your purposes here in our church, our community, and around the world. Amen. Six thirteen. Scripture reading today is from John 6, 35, 41 to 57. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the people began to murmur in disagreement because he had said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his father and mother. How can he say, I came down from heaven? But Jesus replied, stop complaining about what I said, for no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me, and at the last day I will raise them up. As it is written in the scriptures, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone who has ever seen the Father, only I, who was sent from God, have seen him. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever, and this bread which I will offer so the world may live is my flesh. Then the people began arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man give us his flesh to eat, they asked. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. I live because of the living Father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me.
kind of a, an interesting passage, isn't it? When Gordy was reading it yesterday and preparing for today, he said, what is this that you have me reading tomorrow? Eating flesh and drinking blood? Jesus speaks of eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Is it any wonder that the uh, early Christians were thought to be cannibals? Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in ways of eternal life, through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Commentator, scholar, and seminary professor William Barclay explains that the, the flesh of Je that Jesus is referring to is, is his humanity. In the letter of 1 John, we read, Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Our Christian faith posits that Jesus was both fully human and fully di divine all at the same time. And for some, it was the divinity of Jesus, the, the fullness of God in Jesus that was difficult to grasp and accept. For others, it was the, the full humanity of Jesus along with the full divinity that people wrestled with. So how could God be in human flesh? You might have noticed at the beginning of this passage that the people were saying, how can Jesus be the bread from heaven? We know his parents for Pete's sake. We know Mary and Joseph. So they're acknowledging his humanity, but they couldn't grasp the idea of his divine nature. Barclay puts it this way. He said, Jesus was the mind of God become a person. So this means that in Jesus, we see God taking human life upon himself, facing our human situation, struggling with our human problems, battling with our human temptations, working out human relationships. Therefore, it is as if Jesus is saying, feed your heart, feed your mind, feed your soul on the thought of my becoming human. And when you are discouraged and in despair, when you are beaten down by life to your knees, when you're disgusted with life and living, remember that I took on that life of yours. I took on those struggles upon myself. Barclay continues, Jesus said we must drink his blood. And in Jewish thought, the blood stands for the life. So it's easy to understand why, right? I mean, if you have a big gaping wound and blood is, is um, flowing out of you, life can be ebbing away. And to the Jews, the blood belonged to God. So when Jesus said we must drink his blood, he meant that we must take his life into the very core of our own hearts and being. So Barclay uses this analogy, this uh, example, which I, I like. He says, you know, here's a bookcase, and, and on this bookcase there's a book which you've never read. It may be the glory and wonder of the, the tragedies of Shakespeare, but as long as it remains unread upon your bookshelf, it is external to you. One day you take it down and read it. You are thrilled and fascinated and moved, and the story sticks with you. The great lines remain in your memory, and now when you want to, you can take that wonder out from inside of yourself and remember it and think about it and feed your heart and your, feed your mind and your, and your heart upon it. Once the book was outside of you, now it's inside of you and you can feed on it. It's that way with any great experience in life. It remains external to us until we take it in ourselves. And so it is with Jesus. As long as he remains a, a figure in a book, he is external to us. But when he enters into our hearts, we can feed upon his life and the strength and the dynamic vitality that he gives to us. Jesus said that we must drink his blood, and in that he is saying, you need to stop thinking about me as some subject for theological debate and instead take me into yourself as we open our hearts and our spirits and our minds to Christ, we have real life. This is what Jesus was talking about when he said, abide in me and I will abide in you. We will remain in, in him. When Jesus told us to eat his flesh and drink his blood, he was telling us to feed 
our hearts, our minds, our souls on him to revitalize our lives with his life until we are filled with the life of God. But John is talking um, about, um, Barclay says he thinks that John is talking more about, um, more than just, um, or, sorry, my mind just went blank here. Um, John is talking in this passage about the Lord's Supper, about Holy Communion. Now, I don't know if you've studied the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, closely enough to say, you know, in the Gospel of John, we never read about the upper room. We never read about the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples on the night that he would be arrested and then crucified uh, the next day. We don't see that in the Gospel of John. We read it in the other Gospels. But in this passage, in this chapter 6 of the Gospel of John, we have read the words of communion. If you think about uh, this, this uh, meal that Jesus had just had, a couple weeks ago we read from chapter 6, the first couple of verses, and we read about Jesus on a hillside with about 5,000 men plus perhaps women and children, um, and he, we hear those words of communion as we hear that Jesus, after the crowd is seated, he says, he, it says Jesus takes the loaves, gives thanks for them, and divides them or breaks them among the crowd. In the United Methodist Church, we have a document titled This Holy Mystery by Gail Carlton Felton, and it explains our United Methodist understanding of the sacrament of Holy Communion. So in that document, you can find a couple of different uh, names for the sacrament. Um, but first of all, the Greek word that was used in the early church for sacrament is mysterion, which basically translates to mystery. Um, and it, it, it reminds us that sacraments, in the sacraments, through the sacraments, God discloses to us things that are beyond our human capacity to know simply through reasoning alone. In a sacrament, God uses tangible, material things as instruments of God's grace. In Holy Communion, we have the bread and the grape juice um, or wine, and in uh, baptism, we have the water ordinary, tangible, material things that become instruments of God's grace. John Wesley defines a sacrament as an outward sign of an inward grace. So the term the Lord's Supper, so maybe you've used that or, or in, in uh, your life's journey you've heard that. So it reminds us that it is the Lord's table, it is the Lord's Supper, it is the Lord Jesus Christ who invites us to come to that table. He is the host. Um, and it also suggests, when we talk about the Lord's Supper, sometimes it, you, it, it might help us think about some other meals that, that Jesus ate um, with a variety of people. Um, he had meals, he sat and broke bread all over the place with people before his death, and then even after his resurrection, we hear about some meals that he shared with people. And so sometimes we just, we call it the holy meal. Now, sometimes the term the Last Supper, you've heard the Last Supper, maybe you Come, uh, the, what comes to mind is the image of that uh, painting, and you have Jesus in the middle and the disciples out to the sides. Um, and that's referring to the, the final meal that Jesus had with his disciples before his arrest and crucifixion. But that's not an appropriate term for what we have as the, the Holy Communion, the sacrament of Holy Communion. But we typically, so we've had the Lord's Supper, the Holy Meal. Um, the Last Supper, um, and then Holy Communion is what we typically refer to it here in this congregation. And that invites us to be reminded that, that it's a holy God who gives God's self to us, and that in this act of communion, um, it's an occasion of God's grace, um, and, and for us to remember the holiness of our communion with God and with one another. And then another word that gets used, maybe you've heard the term Eucharist, um, and that word for this holy meal, it, it comes from the Greek word for thanksgiving. So it reminds us that the sacrament is a, an act of thanksgiving to God for the gifts of creation and salvation. And um, some of you may have heard the term mass. Um, it, and that's used by the folks in the Roman Catholic Church. That comes from a Latin word, missio, which literally means sending forth. 
And so it's, it's um, so the celebration that brings the worship service to a close by sending the congregation out into the world with God's blessing to live as God's people. And then one other term, the divine liturgy. Um, I don't know how many of you may have heard that. That one we hear less frequently. Um, that's the name that's used by um, churches in the tradition of Eastern Orthodoxy. So all of these terms that um, refer to the same practice, it's the eating and the drinking of consecrated bread and wine in the worshiping community. So the early church um, referred to their celebrations as breaking bread, right? Um, and in the, in the Gospel of Luke, the 24th chapter, we read about how the disciples, um, as they walked with Jesus, he appeared to them as they were walking back home to Emmaus, and they didn't recognize Jesus, but when they got to their home and they invited him in, and the breaking of the bread, their eyes were opened, and they saw and recognized Jesus. When followers of Christ gather in Jesus' name, the breaking of bread and the sharing of the cup means a remembering of his life, his death, his resurrection, and it's an opportunity of encountering the living Christ among us. And so when his first disciples gathered and when we gather, we can experience Christ's presence, the presence of the risen living Lord among us and we receive a sustenance for our journey. John and Charles Wesley, who were the founders of the Methodist movement, uh, recognized the power and the grace of God available in and through the sacrament. They knew that Holy Communion is a powerful means through which divine grace is given to God's people. Now, the Christian church has struggled through the centuries to understand just how Christ is present in the Eucharist, in the Holy uh, Communion, but the Wesleyan tradition affirms the reality of Christ's very real presence. Not, we don't believe that the elements actually become the body and blood of Christ in any sense, but we do believe that Christ, the living, risen Christ, meets us at this table of Holy Communion. Communion is a gift from God. It's, it's a gift to the church. Um, it's, it's an act of the community of faith. So while we might as individuals have powerful moments and experiences individually at the table, the table is not an individualistic, uh, but a communal and community um, uh, event. And so by responding to the invitation to come to this table, uh, we affirm and deepen our relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and we affirm our commitment to membership and mission in the body of Christ. If you think about what you've read in the Old and New Testaments, you'll know that bread has been used in both to signify God's sustenance of human beings and the importance of our eating together. Now, historically, the church has used wine, right? You've heard me talking about the bread and the wine. Um, but um, in the late 19th century, when um, there was the, the movement in our country against beverage alcohol, I believe it was called Prohibition, um, but uh, the, uh, the Methodist women, I believe it was, and predecessor bodies you know, were, were uh, fighting against alcohol. And um, so the predecessor bodies of the United Methodist Church began to use unfermented grape juice for our Holy Communion. And that's the position of our churches today. And so just if any of you have heard me saying the bread and the wine, um, just know that as you come forward, if you have ever had issues with alcohol, you don't need to worry because this will not uh, be something that, that could uh, trigger that for you, I think. So anyway, um, this ritual of the great thanksgiving, the consecrated elements become for us in some sense the body and blood of Christ that he told us we were to partake in remembrance of him. The Apostle Paul understood the, the sacrament of Holy Communion to form and shape the church for its mission and uh, of redeeming the world. And so we as United Methodists have inherited a, a, an understanding that, that emphasizes that the spiritual benefits that we receive in the midst of this journey and even at this table are, are not received just for ourselves, but also to prepare and propel us 
for the work of evangelism, which is sharing the good news of God's saving love in Jesus Christ. It's not about taking a Bible around and beating anybody over the head with it. It's not about waiting, shaking people until they confess uh, Jesus as Lord or to say a particular prayer. It's about us sharing our life experience, how God has touched us through Christ, how Christ has made a difference in our lives. It's about sharing the good news that God loves everyone. God loves them and desires to be in relationship with them. That's evangelism. The, the, the Greek word there is good news. Um, so it's about sharing that good news of God's love. Um, friends, the, the bread of life is no ordinary bread. There is a staying power in this bread. It continues to nurture and nourish us long after we have come to this table and received. It sustains us throughout life and at the communion table, we are reminded of Christ's sacrifice of his flesh and his blood so that we might be forgiven and healed and set free from sin, that we might be drawn into a loving, grace-filled relationship with our creator and with our Lord Jesus Christ. I invite you to take your bulletins and right after the message, there's a response to the word, and I would like you to share in that prayer together with me. We marvel at the wisdom of your word, O God of heaven. May these words we have heard become nourishment for our souls and guidance for the living of our daily lives. Write these words on our hearts, O Lord, that we may be reflections of your truth and mercy. Amen. And our call to action for this week, as food nourishes every part of your body, let Jesus' presence continually nourish you, starting right now at this holy table of communion. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins, and who seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord.
So, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Holy Spirit, in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death. You made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke the bread, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the supper, he took the drink. And he said, and he gave thanks to you, and he gave it to the disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and the cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all glory and honor is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. seek to be in a right relationship with God, all who feel prompted by the Holy Spirit are invited to receive these elements. You don't need to be a member of this congregation or the United Methodist Church. You are welcome as the Spirit prompts you to come. What I will invite you to do is to come forward and receive a cup, um, a prepackaged cup. I invite you to come down the center aisle, go out to the sides, go back and hold that until all have received and are back in their pews, in their seats, and then we will receive together. Come for all things that are made ready.
the blood of Christ shed for you and for me. Will you stand for prayer? Gracious God, we give you thanks for this gift, this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Now may we go forth to give ourselves for others in your holy name. Amen. Will you join me in singing our closing hymn number 634? God's word is food for our souls and refreshment for our hungry hearts. Jesus is the bread that came down from heaven to feed our hungry souls and give life to us who were dead in our sin. Now filled with the bread of heaven, go to speak, act, and live as Christ in this world. Go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go in God's grace and in Christ's peace.
Amen. Thank you.